Prime Minister Pushpa Kamal Dahal cleared the floor test for the second time. However, the Council of Ministers is yet to gain full shape due to the overwhelming number of aspirants within the ruling alliance, all of whom have staked their claims for ministerial portfolios. Meetings between the parties have been intensified in search for a consensus. Good evening, I'm Sarah Chitrakar and these are the headlines of the hour. Ruling Alliance parties failed to find consensus on cabinet expansion. Office bearers of Nepali Congress and Maoist Centre currently in a meeting for the same. Disputes emerge between parties of Ruling Alliance as by-elections in Bara constituency two nears. Jata Samajwadi expresses grievances over Alliance partners' aspiration for the lower house seat. At a press conference following his disqualification as Lok Sabha member, Congress leader Rahul Gandhi says Indian Premier Modi is scared, raises questions on his relationship with businessman Adani. And a departmental team, APF, enter into the finals of Lalitpur Mayor's Women's Championship, defeating Koshi Province by seven wickets. Sudur Pashim Province defeats Madesh Province by seven wickets. A meeting of the office bearers of Nepali Congress and Maoist Centre is underway to finalise on the cabinet expansion. The meeting is to dwell on cabinet expansion that has been due almost, uh, despite the lapse of almost one week since Prime Minister Pushpa Kamal Dahal took the vote of confidence. The 10-party ruling alliance have failed to find a consensus regarding share of ministerial portfolios. Sources say the meeting between two parties is likely to be followed by a meeting of the alliance partners. Parties of the ruling coalition are divided regarding their candidate for the by-election in Bara constituency too. Jata Samajwadi party has been demanding for the constituency. However, the party has now been challenged by Rashtriya Sotantra party, Loktantrik Samajwadi and Janamat party. The three parties have expedited discussions on whether to collaborate or field individual candidates. Janata Samajwadi Party, meanwhile, has called it wrong of the parties of the coalition to announce they would separately contest in the by-election. The party has also added that it was against the sentiment of the alliance itself and has criticized Janamat Party Chair C.K. Raut's visit and address to an assembly in Bada. Jata Samajwadi is expected to field Chairperson Upendra Yadav in the by-election. However, an official decision is yet to be made. Meanwhile, Loktantrik Samajwadi Party and Janamat Party have decided to register for the by-election. Nagari Kunmukti Party that had agreed to collaborate with Janamat Party a few months back is to support the latter in the nearing election. Official decision by Nepali Congress, Mao Center and Unified Socialist for the by-election in Bara, Chitwan and Tanahu is still awaited. Kathmandu Metropolis has given a seven-day ultimatum to remove illegal structures constructed by encroaching public land. Issuing a public notice, the metropolis has warned to remove illegal structures constructed by encroaching river banks and corridors, among other public places. The authority has further notified that such illegal structures will be demolished by the metropolis if the encroachers fail to do so within the given deadline and make them pay the amount incurred during the process. The Kathmandu metropolis on several occasions have been urging to remove such illegal structures. Prior to this, a scuffle had occurred between the authority and the land squatters who have been residing in the riverbank of the Bagmati River. Prime Minister Pushpa Kamal Dahal has said a probe committee will be formed to investigate on the death of a youth in Biratnagar after being hit on the head by police during protest against the new name of Province 1. Following a meeting with representatives of the Federation of Indigenous Nationalities and other communities-wise associations, Premier Dahal said the government would form a probe committee to address the issue. Laje Hang Limbu, who had been injured during protest on 19th of March, passed away yesterday while receiving treatment at the BP Koirala Health Science Academy. A joint struggle committee has demanded the government declare Limbu as martyr and provide his family relevant compensations. They have also urged the Prime Minister to rename Province 1 that was recently named as Koshi Province. The Federation's General Secretary Divas Rai said Premier Dahal responded, saying that he would consult with other parties in this regard. 
Minister for Tourism, Culture and Aviation Sudan Kirati has kicked off the three-month-long Pashupati cleanup campaign. For the next three months, cleaning works in Pashupati premises will be carried out on the leadership of Minister Kirati. The minister has said the campaign was necessary considering the religious significance the temple carries among Hindu devotees across the world. Various organizations had shown solidarity and support as the campaign kicked off today. Nisti Rural Municipality of Palpa has taken action against contractors that have failed to maintain quality work. The authority has taken action against contractors saying that only 50% of the construction works of the main administrative building of the rural municipality had completed despite only 11 months remaining for its completion. The authority has said as a penalty the contractor has been directed to demolish the structure and reconstruct it. The chief administrative officer of the rural municipality has that contractor company, Rabina Shreya Adarsha J.V. Sharowa Mahottari, had been hiring insufficient number of labors and causing delay in construction works. The authority has directed the contractors to reconstruct the building by maintaining its quality and ensure adequate supervision of experts. The authority has issued bids for the second time for repair of road sections in Chiruwas and Galdha of Nisti and Wakamlang Sahalkot and Amityal of Jamire due to delay in repair works. Time now for international update. Indian opposition leader Rahul Gandhi on Saturday has asked tough questions to Prime Minister Modi about his relationship with Gautam Adani, founder of the embattled Adani conglomerate. Gandhi was ousted from the Indian parliament yesterday, a day after a court in the western state of Gujarat convicted him in a defamation case and sentenced him to two years in jail. The court granted him bail and suspended his jail sentence for 30 days, allowing him to appeal. The defamation case was linked to Rahul Gandhi's speech that allegedly insulted Modi as a thief. Congress party and its allies have criticized the court, ruling as politically motivated. Gandhi told a news conference at the headquarters of Congress party in New Delhi that Modi was scared of his next speech and that it will be on Adani case. Gandhi said in his first comments since the conviction and disqualification that the ruling party does not want his speech in the parliament. U.S. President Joe Biden and Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau presented a united front against what they call authoritarian regimes as Biden visited the Canadian capital days after the leaders of China and Russia met in Moscow. At a joint news conference with Trudeau, Biden questioned the level of China and Russia's cooperation, noting that China has not provided weapons to Russia for use against Ukraine. Biden said the U.S. had expanded allies, in fact, alliances, including with NATO, the G7, South Korea, and the Quad nations of the U.S., Australia, India, and Japan. Later at a state dinner, Biden said that they stand together as friends and as family, a view echoed by Trudeau. Trudeau announced the two leaders had signed an agreement with IBM to develop semiconductor capacity and ease reliance on foreign makers after supply chain problems bedeviled both countries. Biden added the U.S. Defense Production Act will give $250 million. Canada has an abundance of critical minerals used to produce batteries and electric vehicles, EVs, but China currently dominates the global market. Biden announced $50 million to incentivize U.S. and Canadian companies to invest in packaging semiconductors and said Canada would provide up to $182 million for semiconductor projects in the near term. The two countries also agreed on an energy transformation task force focusing on clean power and vowed to cooperate on a North American critical mineral supply chain. Ahead of their meetings, the two leaders had already struck a deal aimed at stopping asylum seekers from traversing the shared U.S.-Canada land border via unofficial crossings. 
Canada agreed to take in 1,500 migrants from countries in the Western Hemisphere as part of the deal. Brazil and China are in talks to create a fund for financing the development of green industry and renewable energy in both countries. Brazilian Environment Minister Marina Silva said the new fund under discussion would be used to recover forests and develop a more sustainable economy, including the production of green hydrogen. The proposal could be announced during President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva visit to Beijing next week, although a government official said there were still some details to work out. In the case of China, the world's biggest emitter of greenhouse gases, Silva expects there to be an increasingly strong agenda on the issue of climate, the protection of forests and biodiversity. Silva said, however, that China will not join the billion-dollar Amazon fund started by Norway to finance sustainable development and protect the world's largest tropical rainforest, which Spain, France and Britain are looking at joining. She said Brazil already received a commitment from the administration of U.S. President Joe Biden on climate policy and forest protection when Lula visited the White House last month. Argentines have rallied in Buenos Aires to remember the thousands of victims of the military dictatorship that took power 47 years ago. Protesters descended on Central Plaza de Mayo, holding banners with photos of the disappeared during the military dictatorship and demanding justice for the victims. Human rights groups banged drums, sang songs of solidarity and hold banners emblazoned with the remembrance movement's rally cries for memory, truth and justice. Around 30,000 people are thought to have disappeared during the brutal 1976-83 dictatorship. In 1990, responsible officials received a controversial government pardon, but this was revoked under the leadership of the former president, Cristina Fernandez. The National Day of Remembrance was declared a national holiday in 2006 on the 30th of anniversary, in fact, the 30th anniversary of the coup, a day that was marked by massive demonstrations. Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen visited army engineers today to review their training, saying that defending democracy is the armed forces' great mission. Troops showcased battlefield engineering work and close hand-to-hand -hand combat. The visit came ahead of a sensitive and high-profile trip by Tsai to the United States and Central America. Military tensions between Beijing and Taipei are at their highest point in decades as China tries to force Taiwan into accepting Chinese rule. Taiwan's democratically elected government strongly rejects China's sovereignty claims, saying only the island's people can decide their future. American writer and comedian Lee Champ has said an international meeting on democracy in Beijing that the U.S. has pumped billions of dollars and spent endless time to spread hatred, distrust and fear among Americans against other countries. Camp, who was also Camp, who was also once a host for Russian international news network RT America, made the remarks at a parallel session themed a democracy and the diversity of human civilization at the International Forum on Democracy. At the parallel session, Camp warned against the harmful and dangerous practices of the American media to unfairly reduce people from other countries to a caricature of evil villains and made a plea for humanity to put up efforts and make the planet a livable place. The International Forum on Democracy gathered hundreds of guests from over 100 countries and regions as well as international organizations. India has seen a spike in COVID and influenza-related cases in recent weeks. However, doctors say there is no need to panic as the hospitalization rate is still low. The federal government has ordered fresh mock drills in hospitals across the country to test their COVID preparedness as India recorded 1,300 COVID cases on Thursday, the most in 140 days. 
The eight states where the maximum number of COVID cases are being reported currently are Maharashtra, Gujarat, Kerala, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Delhi, Himachal Pradesh and Rajasthan. A calf with unique black and white markings that appear as a smiley face has quickly become a public favourite in Australia's south. The Holstein Frisian bull calf breeders Megan and Barry Coaster nicknamed him Happy when they discovered his smiley face markings on his side last week. The couple, though, decided to sell the one month old calf to Farm World for US$6,652. The Australian Broadcasting Corporation reported. The proceeds of the sale will be donated to the West. Gippsland Hospital. According to local media, Happy will act as a mascot for Farm World, an agriculture and farming event, and will live on the site at Lardner Park in Victoria. Sports News. Departmental team APF have entered into the finals of Lalitpur Mayor's Women's Championship, defeating Koshi Province by seven wickets. Koshi had opted to bat first, having won the toss, but were limited to 87 runs in 20 overs, losing five wickets. Skipper Rubina Chetri and Kajal Trester collected 34 runs in their first wicket partnership. Sita Ranamagar bowled Rubina in ninth over and then thumped Kajal in the 17th. Rubina collected personal 24 runs and Kajal 27. Apsari Begum contributed 22 runs in the Koshi innings. Smriti Katwal ran out for eight runs and Shabnam Rai was balled out by Sita Ranamagar without collecting a single run. Sita took three wickets and Indu Verma won. APF reached the target in 18.1 overs, losing three wickets. Sita was the top scorer with 19 runs. Jyoti Pandey scored 11 and Indu added 18 runs. Mamata Chaudhary remained unbeaten at 21 and Roma Thapa at 11. Having won three consecutive matches, APF reached the finals with one game in hand. Sudur Pashim province have clinched their second win in the Lalitpur Mayor's Cup Women's Championship, defeating Madesh province by seven wickets as Ritu Kanojia put up an all-round performance. In the match held in TU Cricket Ground in Ketipur, Madesh have opted to bat first. However, most of its players failed to score in double digit and were limited to 65 runs in 19 overs. Alisha Yadav and Sarsati Kumari scored 15 runs each. Lakshmi South took three wickets for 15 runs. Ritu and Samchana Khadka took two wickets each. In response, Sudrupashim reached the target in 10.3 overs, losing three wickets. Kabita Kumar returned to the pavilion, scoring just one run. Samchana Khadka scored nine, and skipper Bindural scored 10. Ritu and Samchana Podar partnered for the fourth wicket, collecting 33 runs. Ritu scored personal 21 runs, while Ruby remained undefeated at 14. Sarsuti Kumari, Santoshi Chaudhary and Anuradha Chaudhary took one wicket each. This is Sudhir Pashim's second win in three games and have collected four points to stay at second position of the points table. For Madesh, it was the second consecutive defeat. Time now for our segment, Public Pulse, where you text us with your opinion. Public Pulse. Here's the question, what should be done to put an end to the exodus of athletes? Your options are A, adequate facilities at home, B, regular tournaments, and C, improvements in regulating entities. Voting is on, tap any WS, select your option, A, B, C, or, and send it to 34001 to share your opinion with us. Bhutan are playing against Laos today in the second match of the Prime Minister Three Nations Cup. The match is currently underway at Dashrath Stadium. This is the first match for Bhutan while Laos had suffered a 2-0 defeat at the hands of Nepal in the first match. Laos had maintained good ball possession and created plenty of opportunities but had lacked in finishing in their first match, which they will look to improve in today's clash. A win today is crucial for Laos to keep their hopes alive for the final. Meanwhile, Bhutan will book their place in the final with a win today and still have one match in hand. Even if today's match is held to a draw, Bhutan will still have a chance to enter into the finals. Bhutan will play against Nepal on Tuesday next week. 
The winner of the tournament will be awarded a cash prize of 5,000 US dollars. As per our latest update, Laos is leading 1 nil as they open their account three minutes into the match as Bon Pachan Bong Kong found the net. That's all for the moment. Our next English bulletin will be at 10.30 tonight. Thank you for watching. Bye for now.